you who are um, watching from home or wherever you might be holidaying or visiting, we're really pleased to have you with us. Um, for those of you who don't know and are visiting today, my name is Tony and the team and I are really glad that you're here to share this special morning with us. Isaiah 53, verses 3 to 7 says, He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain. Like one from whom people hide their faces, he was despised and we held him in low esteem. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering. Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds, we are healed. Mm. We all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. Because above all, he wanted us. He loved us, and he gave up everything so that you and I could know him and could be his children. How awesome is that? So who are you here to meet this morning? Are you here to meet your saviour? Are you here to meet that man who hung on the cross for you? Are you here to meet the Christ, the King, who sits at the right hand of God? Be blessed this morning, I pray. Won't you please stand with us to sing?
Heavenly Father, we thank you for your gift. We thank you for your sacrifice. Jesus, we can't begin to imagine what you bore on that cross for us. But we know that you did it because you loved us, that you wanted to honour your Father, that you were obedient to your Father. And we thank you. We were dead without you, but now we have life because of you. And Lord, I just pray that this service this morning, that each one would be touched by your spirit, that each one would know your presence here this morning. Lord, I pray with a heart of gratitude, Lord, with a heart of thanks and humility for what you have done. In Jesus' name, amen. You'll love this one. That's all I'll say. Sing it like you mean it.
just listen to that piano all day. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to ask you to take a seat. Um, we have an item for you this morning. You may know the song. The words are going to be up on the screen. So please, if you want to sing with us, feel free to. Won't you please stand with us and continue to sing When I Survey the Wondrous Cross.
God and Heavenly Father, we come before you now to hear your word, to listen to your voice. Lord, we pray that through Pastor PJ, you will touch us and reach into our very soul. Let us have ears that hear and hearts that are willing to receive and respond. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thanks, Pastor PJ. Thank you very much, uh, Tony, and to the team. Wonderful music today, isn't it? It's a beautiful day to, to remember our God, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. My name is PJ. Um, welcome to our Good Friday service. Um, if there are visitors, our first-timers, welcome, welcome. Thank you for joining us this morning. And so, as Good Friday, what we, what we are going to do is we're going to celebrate um, what Jesus has done for us. And sometimes it's hard to, it's hard to say, Good Friday, how could it be good um, when Jesus suffered and even died um, a very difficult death on the cross for us? But it is amazing because as we've been talking about, as we've been singing about this morning, Jesus died for us, for our sake. And that actually has a lot of implications in our life, even today. And so what we look at is what Jesus' death means for us, the faithful, those who have chosen to put um, our lives, um, our whole lives surrendered to him. And what does that do as well to our daily lives? So we will be looking at Romans chapter 5, verses 1 to 11. And let's see how, how much Jesus um, loves us and how that really applies in our lives every day. So with that, let me read from Romans 5, um, verses 1 all the way to verse 11. And it says here, Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance, character, and character, hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. You see, at just the right time when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person, someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? For if, while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Not only, this, not only is this so, but we also boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we now have received reconciliation. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for our Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for your love for us. Thank you for what you have done for us and how you are continuously blessing us and working in our lives day by day. Help us to hear you again this morning. Speak to us and help us to align our lives with you. We praise you and pray all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, so let's look at that in more detail. In verses 6 to 8, we see here what Jesus has done for us. When we were still powerless, Christ died for who? The ungodly. And that is you and me included. Because the reality is, you know, I'm sure we're good people, but so many times in our lives, we've ignored God. So many times in our lives, we've chosen to do what we want rather than what God wants, even though it hurts Him. Even though the things that we do sometimes go directly against what, what the Lord's will is. And sometimes we also forget how great a sacrifice God did. Uh, to put it into perspective, um, 
if we have someone that is hostile against us, maybe they don't like us at work, maybe in the community, um, they always make fun of us, or they, they just simply ignore us, would you be willing to do even a small favor for that person? You know, that person just really hurts you, or even worse, maybe they've, they've hurt someone you love. Would you go out of your way to even give them maybe um, a small, small help in, in their daily life? But what God did for us, even though we weren't saying sorry to him, even though we weren't really um, regretful or seeking after him, what he died for humanity, you and me included, is he died for our sake. He was willing to give up the comforts of heaven to go to the world for us, someone who isn't even worthy of anything, who has been against him, rebellious to him. And we may say, oh, I'm really not that rebellious against God. But our hearts are. In our daily lives, that happens. And yet Jesus proactively took the first step to reach out for us. Isn't it amazing? God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He gave up his comfort, his authority, took on flesh, lived a very difficult life in this world because he loves you and he loves me. He wanted to pay for your sins and mine so that we could have another opportunity to be back in a relationship with him. That's how much he loves us. And Tony read um, Isaiah 53 earlier. This is what Jesus had to go through, at least... Uh, this is just, just a small part of it. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed. Look at the, the language. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds, we are healed, you and me, because of the sacrifice of Jesus. We were against him, and yet he died for us. We, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way. We were doing whatever we wanted to do. We were ignoring God, and yet he died for us. The Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Amazing love, isn't it? Amazing love that God has for us. He didn't even have to love us, and but for some amazing reason, God has chosen to love you, to love me, even at the cost of his own life. Praise God. Praise God. What does this mean now for us, for the faithful, those people who have chosen to believe in Jesus? What does this mean? Well, there are um, a few implications, actually several implications. We're, we're probably not going to look at all of them this morning. But from our text in Romans, we, we can see at least two, at least a couple of amazing things that the death of Jesus has um, achieved for us. First is justification. So what's that all about? Let, let's, let's read a little bit. Romans 5, 1 to 2, Therefore, since we have been justified, sounds like a very churchy word, um, and it says we're justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus. Again, it's not through us, but because of what Jesus has done for us, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. Let's jump to Philippians 3, 9, just just. To clarify this word justification, it says, and be found in him, that's in, in Christ. If we're found in Christ, we have something. It's, it says, they're not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law or from the obedience to the law, but that which is through faith in Christ. The righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. So we are given this status of being justified before God because of what Jesus has done for you and me. Um, it's a righteousness. So what we have is something that we are not worthy of. We did not earn to get it. But if we put our faith in God, and that's all he asks from us, a genuine trust in him, he will declare us justified, righteous even before his eyes. So we'll look at that a little bit further. So since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? So we, we actually deserve punishment. We deserve to experience the consequences of our sin 
um, our wrong choices, our bad actions. But because of what Jesus has done for us and, and all that God asked of us is to trust in Him, to have faith in who He is and what He has done for us and how much He loves us. Justif justification means that the faithful in Christ are declared not guilty, even though we are. Because of what Jesus has done, we are not guilty before God's eyes. We are even righteous before God. And so, again, we are mercifully saved. We, we're not worthy to be saved, but we are because of what Jesus has done for us. And so, we will no longer experience the consequences and the penalty of our sins because Jesus has paid for it on the cross. In God's eyes, we are paid for because of what Jesus has done for you and me. Isn't that an amazing thought? We had a huge, what, what if you had, what if you get your mortgage paid for, for those who have more? That would be an amazing feeling, right? But we have been saved from such a much, much greater debt, a debt that would lead to our an eternal separation from God. And Jesus paid it all freely. We didn't even ask for it. Such an amazing thing that God chose to justify us out of his love for us. And it was Jesus who paid the price. Amazing? Praise God. Praise God for what he's done for us. Now, just a clarification. We'll just look at faith really quickly. In Hebrews 11, 6, this is how faith is, uh, this is how um, faith that is pleasing to God is, is described. Without faith, it says it is impossible to please God. And, and again, justification is by faith. That's all that that God asks of us. Because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists, and, so this is a non-conditional part as well, and that he rewards who? Those who earnestly seek him. What does that mean? Who are those who earnestly seek God? So I had to go to the dictionary to look at the meaning of earnestly. Earnestly, uh, according to the, di the dictionary, says it's serious, seriously, and it's sincere. Uh, it, it's sober or soberly act, thoughtful, thoughtful. Um, if, if you look at the examples in the sentences, you'll find that it is a willful decision. It's an act of the will. So it's not simply, oh, yeah, you know, Jesus, yeah, yeah, I believe in Jesus, you know, I trust in him. I've sort of believed that all of my life. But have you really sat down and really think about what that means? Who is Jesus and what he has done for you? So I, I come from a very religious background in the Philippines. That's very common. And so growing up, you always hear about God. You always hear about going to church. And it's something like, yeah, of course, yeah, that, that's all good. I believe that. I believe God, of course. Jesus, Jesus is great. But have you really made business with him? Have you really thought about if Jesus died for me and he says, trust in me, believe in Jesus, what does that mean? What does that mean in my life? making him Lord and only Savior of your life. We need to deal business earnestly with God, seeking him. To seek God is a desire to find God, to get to know God personally, and to be in a right relationship with him. It's the relationship that God wants out of trust. Again, a lot of religious people would Desire God in a way that, ah, God can solve my problems. God can, you know, work my life out so that things will be all right. And God does that. I'm not saying that he doesn't. He, he does that. He, he absolutely wants to help us. Some people look for God because I want a ticket to heaven. You know, I want a ticket to heaven. And that, again, that's not a bad thing. I, as a Christian, started off that way. I was afraid to go to hell. You know, I went to Sunday school. I heard about, oh, if I don't know Jesus, I'm going to go to hell. And that was a, a first step for me, fear. But it went from there. God did use that so that I would have a desire to know him who loves me and who died for me. And that was the turning point. It, it <coughs> stepped out from just religion into an actual desire to know God. Why does he even love me? It's an amazing thing, yes? That the God who created heavens and the earth loves you. He loves me. He died for me. And that is the kind of faith that God desires from us. A faith that, of course, must believe that he exists and that Jesus is God who, who came for us. 
But it also involves a desire to know Him personally, to live with Him even from now all the way up to eternity. Faith. So saving faith, the kind of faith that pleases God, involves willfully seeking a right relationship with Him. And that affects our lives. It changes our lives day by day. And of course, um, although justification happens instantly, we are declared not guilty and righteous before God, our faith does grow day by day as Jesus relates to us, as Jesus works in our life through the Holy Spirit. All right? Faith, justification. That's why Jesus asks, will you trust in me by faith? Now, next, justification, and then what else? There's another thing that we've already seen in our passage. It's called reconciliation. In the same verses, there's justification. There's also this thing that we, we know as reconciliation. Um, in verses 1 to 2, in verse 10, it says this, Therefore, since we have been justified, we know about that already through faith, we have what? Peace with God. So when he paid for our sins, he just didn't, do it in a very impersonal way, he did it because he wanted that relationship with us. We were hostile to God, um, uh, we were against him, but he wanted to have peace with us. Again, through what Jesus Christ has done, we have gained access by faith into a grace in which we now stand. So mercy is not giving us what we deserve. We are saved from our sins, right? But grace goes even further when God gives us something that we do not deserve. With, withholding our punishment is mercy, but now we have even more grace in which we now stand. We'll, we'll look at that a little bit more. For while we were God's enemies, oh, for if we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through his death, through the death of Jesus. So we know that we are justified instantly, but there's more. How much more having been reconciled so the death of Jesus, if we put our faith in him, we're all also reconciled to him. And that reconciliation has an implication in our daily lives. It says, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Now, justification already means a forgiveness of sins. Justification means we will already have that, that um, eternity with God in paradise because we've been justified but what does it mean to, to be saved through his life? Is there something more? Well, there is. So let's look at this further. In Hebrews 7, 25, it says this. Therefore, he's able to save completely. What does that mean? Does, was the initial salvation partial and not complete? Not really. But what does it mean? Therefore, he's able to save completely those who come to God through him because he always lives to intercede for them. Similarly, Romans 8.34, who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus, who died more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. What does this mean? So salvation does, does not only pertain to our life in heaven. But of course, getting to heaven, experiencing God face to face is probably the most amazing thing. But it's more than that. Eternal life is more than that. Jesus also wants to have a relationship with us right now. And with that, he wants to save us even from our troubles in this world. He wants us to have a full and abundant life even now. Now, this is not a prosperity gospel where God will give you everything that you want and that he will solve all your problems and just give you perfect health all the time. That's not what it is. But God wants to help us and to be with us right now in a loving relationship. He wants to give us what is best for us and our loved ones, even right now. He's able to save completely, not just for eternity in heaven, but even now. That reconciliation with God puts us in a, in a love relationship with him right now. And isn't that amazing to know? That because of what Jesus done, even right now, in your very life, whatever you're going through, you might be struggling, it might be difficult, but Jesus is with you. Because he loves you, and he wants to help you out in the best way possible. Sometimes, sadly, as people, we don't agree with what God says is best. Isn't that true? Sometimes God says, 
you actually need to you actually need these struggles at the moment but we're like god this is so difficult i don't want it well you can you can open up to god tell him god it's difficult but sometimes god says maybe the, maybe you need this i'm teaching you something i'm helping you be ready for heaven through this and if we understand it's out of love that god is doing that it makes things a lot easier our reconciliation to God through Jesus means Jesus is always working for our good. Yes? He's always working for our good. Even though sometimes we don't feel it. Sometimes we don't perceive how God is working. We don't see his hand, but you know what the song says? We can trust his heart. He is before the Father, even now, working for our good. Praise God for his love for us. Look at this, in Hebrews 4, this is, what, uh, this is what we have. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended to heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weakness. What does that mean, to empathize? To empathize is to be able to put oneself in another's shoes. And Jesus can do that because he took on flesh. He knows what it means to live in this world. Look at what he says. We have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are. But of course, Jesus did not sin. But Jesus knows exactly how difficult life is. Jesus knows what it means to lack, to be in poverty. Jesus knows what it means to be betrayed by his friends. Jesus knows what it means to be scorned by the people, to be bullied by the people around him. Jesus knows what it means to give up what he deserves for the sake of others. Jesus even knows what it's like to be tempted. He knows how difficult it is to struggle with sin because he was fully human, just like us. And he did all of that Again, for you and me. Praise God that he was able to conquer all of that. He did not sin. And what, what is Jesus doing? And we read in the earlier passages, he is interceding for us. He is working on, on our behalf in heaven. You know, when, when the Father is looking at us, Jesus is there saying, I understand them. I understand them. I know it's hard to resist sin. I know it's hard to struggle with all of the temptations of life the things that distract us. Jesus knows all of that. And he still loves us and he still works um, as an advocate for us. I know the Holy Spirit does that, but Jesus is doing the same thing in heaven because he loves us. And that should encourage us to what? It says in verse 16, approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find the grace to help us in our time of need. You see, we're re reconciliated to God. We have a good relationship with him now because of Jesus. And whatever it is you're going through, even, even if you feel sinful, you know, sometimes we do sin, you know. We, we forget about God. We get too busy in this world. Sometimes we blatantly refuse to do what he wants. God is still saying, come to me. Come to me. Jesus says, I understand you. I'll help you through. I'll help you get through it. So come to this throne of mercy and grace. Again, mercy, we would not be given the punishment that we deserve. Grace is even more. We would be given a blessing that we do not deserve. We do not need to earn it. We do not need to deserve it. Just come to God. Yes, he's calling you. Come to me. Come to me. Remember that story of the prodigal son where the father was just waiting for his child, his son to come back? And he accepted in open arms lovingly. Let's do that. If we're struggling, if there's anything in our lives, go to God because we are reconciliated. We have a good relationship with him because of what Jesus has done for us. Amen? All right. Now, Jesus' death means we have already seen justification and reconciliation for the faithful, for those who truly want that intimate relationship with God. But what does it do to the faithful? Those, those, the first two affects our status. Uh, primarily, but of course it affects um, our relationship and, and the way we, we connect to God. But it also does something. 
Jesus' death should also do something in how we live our lives. And this, we have more say in this, or we have a, a more, a, a bigger part in, in what Jesus' death does to our daily lives. So what does it do to the faithful? Well, le let's look. In Romans 5, 2 and 11, it says this, through whom we have gained access by faith into his grace in which we now stand. And what happens? What happens to those who have experienced um, that grace and, and, and that reconciliation, that access to God? What happens to us? And we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Not only this, in verse 11, but we also boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have received reconciliation. When we appreciate what Jesus has done for us, when we realize that it means justification, reconciliation, we begin to boast in Christ. To boast in Christ. Now again, I had to go to the dictionary just to look. What does boast mean? To boast is to speak too proudly or happily about what you have done or um, what you own. You, you know, boasting about myself. Oh, I'm so good looking. I, I own so much. Those are, but that's, that's personal boasting. What does Jesus' death and the justification and reconciliation that comes with that do to Christians? We boast, not in ourselves, but in who? In Christ. So to boast in Christ, if we take that definition, is to speak very proudly or happily about Jesus, who he is, and what he has done for you. So does this happen in our lives? That we boast proudly about Jesus. And I, I have to admit, in my life, when I look at my life, sometimes I struggle. Yes? Sometimes it's not always easy. Because we have to admit, even as Christians, sometimes we let the things of this world distract us. We let our own comfort be over what Jesus has already done for us. But in our, but if we just go back to it, um, I believe this is why communion was given by Jesus. Do you remember what Jesus says in communion? Um, do this in remembrance of me and what, who he is and what he's done for us. Because we forget as people. Look at the life of Israel, the nation of Israel. They keep forgetting God. God shows them amazing things. And sometimes just a few days after, they rebel against God. They forget. So I hope this morning we're challenged not to forget rather to remember how much Jesus loves us and what he's done for us so that we would boast about him, who he is, and the amazing justification and reconciliation that we have because of him. It makes us confident to talk about Jesus. And I, I don't mean we, have to ha we, we don't need to sound super spiritual in, in, in everything that we do, like everything is like a Bible verse in it. Just in our daily lives, as we talk with other people, it should be evident how much we appreciate who Jesus is and what he's done for us. When we talk to others, I, again, we don't have to quote Bible verses to them all the time. I mean, if you get the opportunity, why not? But sometimes just talking about how much Jesus has done for you, how, how he got you through this problem, how blessed you feel because it's a wonderful day. Look at the day today. The weather is great. It's a beautiful day. Just talking about that without shame to others and telling them, it's amazing how God gave us this beautiful day. It affects the people around us. It shows how grateful we are, how much gratitude or appreciation we have for who Jesus is and what he's done for us. And when people keep hearing this from us, they will get attracted to Christ, especially when life becomes hard. That's the usual thing. People normally will just ignore Christ. But in their hearts, the Bible says people are really looking for God. They actually want him. They just don't know it. The harvest is many, but the workers are few, Jesus says. And that's still true today. The harvest is many. Yes, they're not aware that they're looking for God. But isn't, isn't it our duty to be his light in the world? We keep shining the light. Yes, darkness wants to flee from light. But there are many, Jesus says, who want him. They just need to hear. And if we boast about Christ, if we let his love rule our hearts, it will come out. It will come out. The Holy Spirit is living in us. So let's remember, let's appreciate, so that we 
would boast in Christ. And again, yes, it's difficult. Many times it's difficult. In Australia, you probably might get ignored. People might feel awkward. But I doubt anyone would kill you for this. I mean, in some parts of the world, they will. But praise God that it's actually easier here for us. But still, there is suffering. There is persecution. There is a sense that people will be against you. But look at that, Romans 5, 3 to 5. Not only so, yes, we will boast. Sometimes it's difficult. That's why we shrink away. But we also, what? Glory in our suffering. Because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance, character, and character, hope. And hope does not put us to shame. If we truly appreciate the eternal life, the salvation, justification, reconciliation that Jesus has given us, it will come out even though sometimes it's hard. Sometimes we just don't think about it that much. We, we don't focus on it, and that's why other things become the priority of life. But I know if you have already put your faith in Jesus, God's love is in your heart. The Holy Spirit is living in you, and he is working so that we could live for Christ, that we could boast about Jesus. Sometimes we just focus on other things. So I hope this morning this challenges all of us, myself included, to look at my life. What am I focusing on? Am I appreciating and remembering what Jesus has done for me? Because if I do, then I will also appreciate even the difficulty that comes with living for Jesus. We glory in our suffering. So talking about and living for Jesus can be challenging, but if we have faith in Him, we will actually gladly endure a life for Jesus. We will persevere. We just need to go back to Him. We can ask for His help. He will help us. And, and we find that, yes, sometimes people become awkward towards me. Sometimes um, they might even avoid me. But if we're following God... We know that it's for their good, and we know that God is pleased when we try to share, to boast about Him, to show Him in our daily lives. So we glory even in our suffering. But again, remember what we've already seen in Hebrews 4? Jesus understands how difficult it is. He was persecuted for His message. If it's difficult, what do we do? We go before God's throne of grace. We ask for help. God, it's difficult to live a Christian life in my workplace. In my workplace, you know, people don't really seem to like you. They talk about many worldly things. Or in, in my circle of friends, they don't seem to appreciate me talking about my faith. We go to God. God, what shall I do? I want to live for you. Help me. And what do we find? The mercy and the grace that we need in whatever situation we find ourselves in. It's amazing what God gives us, eh? We have everything in Him. But let's remember, Jesus loves you. He even died on the cross for you. He won't withhold anything good from you. And that's from the Bible. <laughs> so Jesus died in your place because God loves you, that the love of Jesus, the Holy Spirit, and your faith in Him control your daily life. You are justified and reconciled. Boast in Christ. Be willing to glory in suffering for Jesus. Let me close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for your amazing love for us. We thank you for your only begotten Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, who took on flesh to die in our place to pay for our sins. And thank you, Jesus, that you rose from the grave to assure us that you have power over life and death, that we now have eternal life because of what you've done. And more than that, you are at the right hand of the Father working for our good, interceding for us again because you love us. You only want what's good for us. Help us to trust in you so much that our daily lives would be lived for you in the things that we say, do, and act. We commit ourselves to you, God. Thank you for your love. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thanks, Pastor PJ. Why don't you please stand with us to sing our final song.
praying for all of our sins, past, present, even future sins. Even if we do fall, we thank you that forgiveness is always available in you. And we thank you that your promise is you will complete the work, the good work that you have started in us. You are the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. Help us always to remember how much you love us, that you died on the cross to pay for our sins, and you rose from the grave to assure us of eternal life and to intercede always on our behalf. As we go out this week, and even as we remember you even further this weekend, may your love rule in our hearts so that we would be able to, to live for you, to boast about you even, to glorify you because of who you are and what you have done for us. Bless us abundantly. Be with us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, everyone. Have a great week.